Hi, welcome back to Verilog Fundamentals. You're learning the most popular hardware description language, Verilog. In this module, I'll begin the discussion of variables by talking about fundamental types, otherwise known as built-in types. And then I'll show you how to work with variables of different types. When you write a module that does something real, it will do something with variables. And in Verilog, those variables need to be defined in some way in your code. Verilog is a weakly typed language, but it's complicated. A variable can switch to holding data of a different type during execution. You can define 32 bits and make it hold an integer at the start, and then suddenly, later during your execution, you can switch to make it hold four characters instead. We'll get into Verilog's perspective on why this is the case later. By default, the language lets you use variables that you did not declare. However, there is a huge stipulation about that behavior in the standard. Only a scalar single bit net will be created and it will be assigned the LSB of the right hand side or least significant bit of the right hand side of the uh, assignment operator. This compiler directive shown here disables this implicit declaration feature. And I think that disabling this feature is good practice. It can potentially save you from writing a line of code in a very large design that doesn't take the full value that you think it is. We'll see an example of this later. The compiler is here to help you. The error messages and warning messages are designed to bring things like mistakes to your attention. The purpose is to help you increase the accuracy of your design. There's a set of data types that are designed to model physical hardware. Things like wires for connecting and registers for memory. There are also some more complicated types like tri-reg, which allows you to drive a signal onto a wire from multiple sources. There is also a set of data types that are not for modeling hardware, but you want to still be able to track a value, so we are given things like integers, real numbers, and time. Verilog has something unique in that the entire language only has four fundamental values. Zero is a value that represents logic zero or a false condition. One represents a logic one or true condition. X represents an unknown logic value. Sometimes I'll refer to it as a don't care and Z represents a high impedance state. This state means that there is a huge resistance to current. The reason for this is that we're trying to model hardware in this programming language. And these four types are the different states that can occur in storage or in transmission elements. When creating wires and registers, we immediately need to know how can we create more than one wire in a single line of code and how can we create more than a one-bit register in a single line of code? Vectors and arrays allow us to do this. Vectors will assign an index to each bit. We do this using square brackets and before the variable name is written in the declaration. Two numbers go inside the square brackets and the left-hand side number is representing the index number assigned to the most significant bit and the right-hand side number is representing the index number assigned to the least significant bit. All the bits in between these two numbers are going to be assigned to all the bits in between the most significant bit and the least significant bit. So in this example here, we see that uh, we're declaring a register uh, with the left-hand side number being set to four and the right-hand side number being set to zero and the variable name is being set to A. The result is that we're going to have a 5-bit register. We're counting from 4 down to 0 inclusively. So bit number 4 is the most significant bit. Then we have bit 3, bit 2, bit 1, and bit 0, which is the least significant bit, bit 0, when indexing A. And we'll see code later that shows that we can simply refer to these bits by writing out the variable name. So in this case, I'll type A, and then I can type square brackets to access the index 
that I want to select. I can access the bit that I want to select using that numbering scheme in the declaration. Right below A, we see B, and something interesting happened here with B. We're actually assigning the most significant bit to zero and the least significant bit to three. And this is perfectly valid, you can do this. And the result is we're going to have B that is a four bit register with the most significant bit being zero. And then we can access each index going down to the least significant bit as we count up. So zero, one, two, three. If we want multiple registers or wires of a certain bit width, then we can use arrays. This means we put another set of square brackets after the variable name. It will create multiples of that register or wire with that bit width. So in this example here, we've declared a register with a bit width of eight, and we're saying the most significant bit is zero, and the least significant bit is bit number seven. And all the bits in between have their assigned index numbers for a total of eight bits for this mem variable. But then right after that, we do another set of square brackets, this time specifying that this is an array. And in this particular example, we're basically defining one kilobyte of memory. So each slot in this memory is one byte or eight bits. And we have 1023 down to zero for a total of 1024 bytes or one kilobyte. Okay, let's uh, let's walk through these examples here on demo three of this Verilog tutorial series. Um, what I'm doing here is I have declared a bunch of registers. I just want to show you that you can, you know, instead of putting them all on each line and typing register or sorry reg each time and adding a semicolon at the end of it, you can actually put them all separated by lines on here. Let me go into an initial begin block and uh, we'll talk more about this later, but just ignore it for now. And what I'm doing in here is I'm assigning all of these variables of value and I'm assigning them each the four fundamental types of Verilog. And then we have this huge display function call system task where we have dollar display parentheses and then we start to supply our arguments. And let me break down specifically what this is gonna do. It's gonna print out the text T1 space equal space. And then this percent B is gonna get replaced with the variable T1. So T1 will match up here. Then we have this backslash N. The backslash is sort of like known as the break character. And then when you type an N right after a backslash, you're basically giving it a new line. It's like hitting the enter key. So I got all of these piled up and they're all gonna print out here. And before I build and run this, let's take a look at what we have down below. So now I'm gonna uh, declare some vectors and arrays. And here we have a uh, reg register called A, which is five bits, and we have a register called B, which is four bits. And then here I did something fun. I have a reverse order, or um, we should actually call this like uh, bitwise big NDN. And then these are bitwise little NDN. And you can go read about what these are online. But basically what we're saying is like, if I access bit zero, and we'll see this in an upcoming example, but if I access bit zero, uh, I'm gonna get the most significant bit first. If I access bit zero for B, I'm gonna get the least significant bit. So clearly they're both gonna hold you know a value, but um, there's a huge implication about how you're indexing these bits. But then what we're doing here is sort of like what we did before. This time I'm going to display these registers before I've written to them. Then I'm gonna to write to them. So here we can see I'm writing 10101 to A, all zeros to B. Oh, and notice I have a five tick mark. 
that's saying uh, oh and a B that's saying that this value is going to be a five bit value and these are the bits if I try to change this to a six and I save that it's gonna tell me that's an illegal character and a binary constant we can't do that it's got to be a zero or a one and this is giving me a warning telling me that this is a little bit endian vector and I just told you that it is big endian um, so what's going on here uh, I actually had to uh, I was pretty sure I was correct about this so I was pretty sure big endian uh, is how you write this and then this is little endian but this is saying the opposite it's saying little bit endian vector which is really confusing so I really carefully studied this example and I actually opened a pull request to change this in the compiler and I already heard back from the developers of Verilator which makes this linting possible and they said that they do agree that this the warning's fine but this is mislabeled this should be big bit NDN vector instead of little but anyways we'll ignore that for now um what I'm doing here is I'm setting C and we notice that we're setting uh, C to be an array one down to zero, which gives us a total of two bytes in C. So we have byte number zero and I'm setting eight bits and I'm saying XX or don't care, don't care, one, one. And then I'm using this underscore. Now the underscore is totally ignored inside uh, Ver Verilog. Uh, this is strictly to make it easier on the eyes to read this number. So if I wanted to read this binary number, I can see it in groups of four. It just makes it nicer to read and you can put as many as you want in here and it's not going to, it's not gonna mess it up. So I just saved it and it's not marking this wrong. But I like to group my bits in groups of four. And then we're also setting the other byte in C. And then we're printing it out again. Okay, so let's go ahead and run this. I'm gonna go over to my task runner and I'll click build. And then I will click run. And I'm gonna close the Explorer view and stretch out my terminal window here. And we can see T1, T2, T3, and T4 all printing out their values. And so this text here, T1 equals space, that corresponds to T1 equals space. And then the zero, it, that is where the percent B used to be, but it's being replaced with what is actually inside T1, which is zero. And then this backslash in, well, we didn't see a backslash in on the printed output. Instead, what we got is it started moving down to the new line, sort of like hitting the enter key. So that's what this is doing. And we can see T2, T3, and T4. Now we'll go down to our second section of the code here and we can see that we printed out all of the bits of all of our registers before they've been initialized. And Verilog is telling us that they're filled with don't cares or X's. And I think this makes a lot of sense. Then after we assign our values, we can see that they all fill in nicely down here. One thing I want to call out from that demo is simulation input output. We saw that we are using the dollar display system task to print output values to the screen. The display task works by writing it out and then supplying arguments in the parentheses. In the parentheses, the first argument is the string that we want to print to the screen, followed by an ordered list of variables to print. Inside the first argument, the string, we have the percent %b, which marks where in the message the variable will be printed out. It also notes how the variable should be printed out. In this case, b is for binary. We're printing out the ones and zeros, or maybe the x or the z of each bit in that value. The number of percent %b's tokens needs to equal the number of variables in the arguments. So in this example on the screen here, our pattern string 
has two percent b's and after the pattern string all of the other arguments inside the display function a and b equals two and so these need to equal each other input to the simulation can be done by way of test bench so we can write code that is going to feed values to our modules and to our digital circuits from the outside we'll see this some more later in this course we can also initialize memories with data files let's say that we have a large memory bank and we need to load it with some data there are two provided system tasks that can do this read mem b and read mem h we'll experiment with these system tasks later in this course implicit declaration means that you are going to use a variable that you did not declare you did not write a line of code that declares it out of the box and by default the compiler will let you do this it will do this automatically and it may or may not bring to your attention that it did something for you it is important that when you write code you make your intention clear you need to express that you want to do something and you want to do it on purpose implicit declaration can be a dangerous feature in Verilog because it can easily backfire on you to make matters even worse the default behavior of how the compiler makes variables for you can be changed this can make it really difficult to understand what certain code is doing it can also make it difficult to debug and troubleshoot problems of course, all this is better explained in code. I've made a few changes to our code here, and I've added a comment up here at the top in demo four. This is basically the demo three code, but we've expanded it. We've still got all our four fundamental types coming out here, and I wanna try hitting F11. Okay, so I just hit F11, and now we're in total full screen view here. Um, we still have our vectors and arrays here. But I've done something interesting here. And what I've done is I've taken B. Well, first I set a delay and I say wait 50 time units. And then I'm taking A and putting it into B. And Verilator linting is giving me the yellow squiggles underneath, which indicates a warning. And it's telling me that the operator assign is expecting four bits on the right hand side. But the right hand side's variable a has five bits and it's a warning because it'll still do this and what's going to happen is we can see b can only hold four bits and we can see a has five bits and what the language is going to do what verilog is going to do is it's going to take four bits from a starting from the least oops sorry about that starting from the least significant bit and moving up until we fill B and everything above so just this one right here everything above those four bits gonna be cut off it's gonna be truncated and so that's what this warning is about you're saying like okay you can do this but did you mean to and it's trying to bring that to your attention and so we're going to go ahead and print out what comes out in here and before I run this, I'm just going to comment out this module. We'll talk about this module in a second here and all this code underneath. So with that commented out, I'm going to save and build and run. Get this out of the way here. And we still have our fundamental types. Very good. And we see our uninitialized registers. Looks good. We already saw this in demo three. But now here in demo four, we see that B was given the lower four bits of A. And this bit here was forgotten about. It was truncated. It wasn't put into B. And that's what happened here. And if A was longer, uh, all of the higher order bits will be truncated. They're just gonna cut it off. Only the lower order bits go into B. That is something to be careful of. So, 
is an interesting behavior of Verilog. You need to be aware of this because it can can totally come back to bite you. Okay, so let's go ahead and uncomment this example module here. And what I have here is I have a couple of registers. These are scalar uh, registers, so they only have one bit. One bit for a clock, one bit for a reset. We're setting the reset to be zero and the clock to be zero. And then always begin every five time units, we're gonna set clock equal to not clock. So we're just flipping the bit. So clock on, clock off, clock on, clock off, and we're making a clock. And we're feeding both of these into our module here. And then right underneath here, we're going to use a system task called finish. So basically we're saying we're gonna run that clock for 500 time units, and then we're gonna, we're gonna run the finish system task, and that will end the entire simulation. So let's look inside this module, and the code for this module is actually just right down here. So what we have here is we have a register called count, which is a byte, and we have this set as a little bit wise NDN, and underneath that we have big bit wise NDN. And that's count two, and they're both starting off at zero. And if we hover over the warning, we already saw this earlier in demo three, it's calling this little. Uh, don't worry, that should be fixed if you're on the latest version of Vera later. Um, we have enable, which uh, is a single bit register um, set to one, and we're basically enabling or disabling our count, and we're gonna leave it on enable. And we're getting a sneak peek at if statements here. Don't worry about it for now. We'll explain it more later. And we're also seeing an always at the positive edge of a clock or a reset. Um, just, just disregard this for now. Don't worry about it. Here's where I want to bring your attention. So we're saying assign a variable called data and fill it up with count. And if we look nowhere else in the code did we say what data is and if I hover over it, we got the yellow squiggle for a warning. And it's saying signal definition not found, creating implicitly data. And then data two is getting count to, which is big NDN. So there's a lot of stuff going on here. But before I run this, I also just want to quickly show, if I uncomment this line, this is a compiler directive. And what you're telling the compiler is that the default, if you're gonna make something, uh, the default type is gonna be none. So you can't, you know, it's it's gonna be a, of type none. And so when the compiler sees, oh, there's data here and it's not been declared, I'm gonna declare it for you. It will try to declare it with type none and immediately it's going to error out. So if I save this, now these yellow warnings have turned to red squiggles, red error. And the problem is signal definition not found. Implicit has been disabled with default net type, none uh, for this data. Same thing with data two, that is an error. And you may be thinking, why on earth would I put something in here that's gonna make my code error out? And it's it's really up to you. like. I think this is better because then I'm not going to write code that's going to do something that I may or may not really understand the implications of. So it's better to just like always, always declare your, your variables. Don't just let the compiler do it for you uh, because you want to be more expressive on what it is that you're trying to do. You want to make it really clear that, Hey, uh, yes, I do want, data to be truncated. I'm going to put data with a width of four bits and I do want it to truncate counts. Or, uh, you know, leaving it like this, you're truncating seven bits. You're going to be keeping the zero bit and cutting the rest of it off. And, you know, if you, you really need to be careful that you know what you're doing and why you're doing that. So with all that said, let's go ahead and comment this back out. I'm holding down the control key and I'm hitting the slash button. 
and I've just commented that line. I'm going to save this. And now they're back to warnings. And so what this code is doing is we're if, if there's a reset signal, we're going to zero out our count and our enable. And then uh, if not, uh, the other thing we're going to be doing is we're going to be counting up. So whatever our count is, it's going to be incremented. Don't worry about this special syntax we're seeing here for now. Uh, we'll come back later and discuss it more. And at the very bottom, we're printing it out. So we're printing out data and data2 in binary. We're printing out count and count2 in binary. Remember that count2 is big endian. So one thing that might be interesting to see is will it get the most significant bit? Bit zero or the least significant bit? Bit seven. Because in this situation, we're going to take count and count is going to try only give the least significant bit and then truncate the rest. If we have zero over here, what will data two get? Well, let's uh, let's take a look to find out. I'm gonna build this and then I'll click run. Close that out and we'll move our window up here and scroll back up. So our output here kind of got messed up because we had a delay and then we started ticking a clock and uh, this delay finished while the clock was ticking. So our output's kind of jumbled here. But if we take a look, data and data two are both getting zero when these guys are zeroed out. And then as soon as both big NDN and little NDN bitwise uh, increment to one, uh, data and data two both got that least significant bit. So it's very clear with this output that it doesn't matter what the bitwise endianness of your registers are. Uh, if data is getting truncated, you're only going to get the least significant bits. And on top of that, if variables are being implicitly declared, they're going to be implicitly declared as a one bit wide variable of the default net type. So that is why we're only seeing one bit here. This is what the compiler decided to do for us when it saw we didn't declare data and data too. And you could see, you could start to see why this could be something you don't want to have happen. Uh, you might be thinking, oh, I did declare the variable called data and you try to use it and you realize a bunch of your data is missing. Uh, so this is something to be careful of. Sometimes you might want to keep track of quantities without using hardware registers. Verilog offers four data types that allow you to do this. Integer is a great general purpose variable that can be used in things like loops. The time variables are used for storing and manipulating simulation time values. And you can do this by setting a time variable equal to the dollar time system task, which outputs the current simulation time. Real allows you to store values that contain decimal points. Real time allows you to store time values that contain decimal points. Let's take a look at integers in action. Let's take a look at another example here. And in this example, I have a module called top and we have two registers here. Both are four bits wide. I've named the first one big, even though it says it's little, uh, with the most significant bit at index zero and the least significant bit at index three. And I've named little to be bitwise little endian. And they're both four, bit, four bits wide. I've initialized both of these registers with the four fundamental values that you can get in Verilog, uh, each bit being set to the value. And then I've declared an integer i. So i is not representing anything in our digital circuit. It is just simply a value or a quantity for us to, to track. And in this case, we're gonna be taking a sneak peek at the for loop. This very much looks like a C, C++ style for loop. 
uh, we initialize the variable, we're setting a condition, and then we're incrementing it. We're gonna see this again more later. And we also see this always at splat, uh, or asterisk symbol again. But we've created this integer i so that we can index or step through each of the bits one at a time and hit every single one. And we're simply printing out their values. And once again, we see our backslash escape character, but this time with a T. And last time we saw it with an N, which represents new line. In this case, T is representing tab. Let's go ahead and build this and we will run the code. And let's window. And here's what we're getting. So uh, little at index zero. So our for loop here, let's back down. Our for loop, i is starting at zero. So this is effectively saying, give me little zero. So whatever bit has the index zero, Go ahead and print that out first. So this first line is saying the bit with index zero is Z, but big is saying the bit with index zero is one. So big is saying one has index zero and little is saying Z has index zero. And that really comes down to how we defined our vector here. So you can see the most significant bit was set as zero. Here, the least significant bit was set as zero. And that's why these guys have different answers. We start to loop through, you know, step through one at a time. So we're saying, okay, whatever I was, add one to it and make sure we're less than eight still. So zero becomes one. And now we're at index one. So for little, that means we've moved to the left from the least significant bit, we've moved to the left, and now we're getting x. But for big, we started at most significant bit, and we've moved to the right. So to the right, one bit significance lower than the most significant bit, which will be one, and we're getting zero. So we go from one down to zero, and so on. And you'll also notice what happens when we start to access registers beyond the boundaries. So uh, we looped i from zero to eight. So it goes all the way up to seven, does not go to eight. And we started printing out the index of bits that are not contained in our register. So we went beyond the boundary of this register. And notice there was absolutely no warning from the compiler, no error from the compiler, and no warning or no errors from the simulator. So this is another thing to be aware of. When you make a vector, you're not protected against stepping outside of that vector's boundaries, just as I did here in this example. Let's go ahead and summarize the things we covered in this module. Variables have a type and can represent physical hardware, or not. Verilog contains four fundamental values. Be careful of how the compiler may truncate values when you transfer values between registers of different widths. And pay attention to compiler warnings. You can change the behavior of your compiler and tell it to never make variables for you implicitly by specifying the following compiler directive, default net type equals none. 